people think of mathematics as a very forbidding subject, very rigid, structured, ancient, cut and dried, and rather difficult to appreciate because of the formalism and the difficulty. As a matter of fact, those who know mathematics realize that in many ways it's like an art form, like music, like painting, like sculpture. It's something which has its own styles, its own periods, something which has evolved down through the ages, many thousands and thousands of years. In fact, it's one of the richest cultural heritages that we have. Like the painter who plays with colors, or the musician who plays with sounds, the mathematician plays with thought. Unfortunately, people who are not themselves mathematicians cannot enjoy mathematics in the same way that they can enjoy music or painting or sculpture because they do not know the language. What I'm hoping to do in this series of program is to present a series of some of the most brilliant mathematical thoughts down through the ages, right up to the 20th century, by using pictures rather than symbolism. Now, of course, a certain amount of symbolism is unavoidable, but I am not assuming that anyone who is watching the program has any knowledge of anything but the most elementary type of mathematics, that is, simple algebra and arithmetic. And to start the program off, I'm going to talk about a very ancient problem, a problem that is 4,000 years old, at least, if not older. This problem has to do with calculating the distance around the outside of a circle. I have here a, a circle, and I've wrapped a string around the outside of it. It's actually a roll of masking tape. If I take the string off, this distance is called the perimeter, and it's represented by a Greek letter, pi. Now, one of the most ancient problems of civilization is to try and calculate what is this distance in terms of the thickness of the circle itself, which is called the diameter. If I try and measure it, I find that I get first one diameter, then a second diameter, and then a third diameter, and a little bit left over. From ancient days, 2,000 years before Christ, in Babylonia, it was known that when you take the circumference of a circle and measure it off the way I have just done, you will get something just a bit more than three. Down through the ages, mathematicians have tried to calculate what this number is more exactly. In fact, it's a very important number. It comes into many mathematical formulas. It's one of the most important numbers in all of mathematics. I've written up here a number of approximate values for pi which were known in ancient times. Starting with the left, 2,000 years before Christ in Babylon, the approximations were used, first the approximation 3, and then 3 and 1 eighth. It turns out that that is not a bad approximation at all for the first two decimal points. In Egypt, they used a strange approximation. It was 16 divided by 9 squared. This wasn't bad either. It wasn't until we came to Greek times, however, that we started to get greater accuracy. The great Greek mathematician Archimedes calculated pi to, to be approximately equal to the ratio 22 over 7, which is 3.14. Now, the way Archimedes did this was by taking a polygon inside a circle and measuring the sides of the polygon and adding them up and seeing that they added up to approximately 22 over 7. In Alexandria, 150 years after Christ, we have another approximation, 377 over 120. This approximation is good to four decimal points, and it was obtained by a more exact method based on Archimedes' approach. 
Well, the story doesn't end there, of course. I have many more approximations. In China, 480 years AD, there is an approximation, 355 over 113, which is accurate to six decimal points, almost to seven decimal points. In India, 530 AD, here is a fantastic approximation. Nobody knows how this approximation was arrived at, but it gives four decimal place accuracy. In Poland, in the 1500s, almost 1600, there is an approximation which is, again, accurate to about five places. Down through the ages, more and more efforts were made to try and calculate pi exactly. In France, in 1579, nine decimal place accuracy was found. In Holland, 1593, 20 years later, 15 decimal place accuracy. In Germany, 1610, 35 decimal place accuracy. This approximation to 35 decimal places involved using a polygon which has more than 100,000 sides. In Scotland, uh, 1706, 100 decimal places was accomplished. And this was used by using, for the first time, what's called an infinite series. I'll be talking more about all of these things later on. Now, just to bring you up to date, I will tell you that uh, when I was eight years old, there were 500 decimal places of accuracy obtained. One year later, when I was nine years old, there was 100,000 decimal places obtained by use of a computer. And the most recent accuracy for pi is to one million decimal places. This is accomplished using a high-speed computer. Now, the amazing thing is that almost 100 years ago, it was proven that no one will ever know the exact value of pi because the decimal expansion of pi never stops and never repeats. It goes on and on forever. Nobody will ever know what the next decimal place will be until it is calculated. This fantastic number is called an irrational number. It's a number which cannot be made into a fraction. Now, of course, the Greeks back in ancient times, 500 years before Christ, back in Archimedes' time, they didn't realize that pi was an irrational number. However, as we will see in this program, they were aware of the fact that irrational numbers did exist, and they had no idea how to, how to really come to grips with the existence of such numbers. It boggled their minds, and I think it still boggles many minds today. Let me go back to ancient times and talk about some other problems of measurement. One of the earliest tricks that was used to calculate measurement was to use what's called similarity. I have here a drawing which takes a unit of length. And here I have a triangle. Now it's possible, of course, to measure the sides of the triangle. I have here two units on one side, one unit, and two and a half units. If you take this triangle and magnify it without changing its shape, you obtain what is called a similar triangle, a triangle with the same shape but a different size. From ancient times, it was known that if you magnify the triangle by a factor of two, then all of the sides will increase by the same factor. This is called a constant ratio. It's a scale factor. It's simply like increasing the scale of a map, which we're very familiar with today. The same thing can be applied to circles. I have here the question of calculating the arc length of a circle corresponding to a certain angle. Now, one of the most useful measurements of angle, besides the degrees that we're familiar with from the Babylonians, the Babylonians, incidentally, believed that there were 360 days in the year. And for this reason, they took the circle and divided it into 360 equal pieces, and they called each one a degree. We still keep that same division today. We also have 60 minutes in every hour, 60 seconds in every minute. These go back to the Babylonians 1,500 years before Christ. But let me get back to the story about the circle. Looking at this diagram, there is a useful measurement of angle, which is called the radian measure. The radian measure is obtained by simply taking a circle of radius 1 
and looking at the arc length that's cut off on that circle of radius one, that distance is called the radian measure of an angle. Now, if I take that circle and magnify it, blow it up, everything increases in the same ratio. Therefore, the arc length of the big circle is going to be found by taking the radian measure of the angle and multiplying it by the factor r, which is the radius of the circle. That's the magnification factor. r is how much you are magnifying the circle. Similarly, around the outside of the little circle, we have diameter 2. Therefore, the length is 2 pi. If I multiply that by r, I get the famous formula, circumference of a circle is equal to 2 pi times r. The similarity of triangles is a very useful device for calculating distances which are otherwise inaccessible. For instance, suppose you want to calculate the height of a tree. Now, you may want to calculate the height of a tree because you intend to chop it down. If you chop it down, you'd rather it didn't crush something that was in the way. Therefore, you'd like to know how long it's going to be when it's lying on the ground. If you look at the shadow of the tree on the ground, you can certainly measure the shadow. If you put a stake in the ground and measure its shadow, you now have two similar triangles. And by using the ratio between the height of the stick and the length of its shadow, you can calculate the height of this tree. And as you see, the mathematics is extremely simple. h divided by 20, that's the height of the tree, divided by the length of the shadow, is equal to 3 over 2. Therefore, h has to be 30. The problem of calculating lengths is very much eased by this concept of similarity. The same thing is applied when we talk about two-dimensional and three-dimensional measurements. I have here in front of me uh, a sequence of what are called the square numbers. Now, these square numbers were particularly favorites of the, uh, of the Greeks. If you increase the scale of a square by doubling the size, you discover that instead of having just a square twice as big, you actually have a square which is four times as big. Similarly, if you increase the square by a factor of three along the side, you get nine squares fitting inside. Here, I have four squared, which is 16. These are called the square numbers, and they're extremely important. It tells you that the area does not scale the same way as the length does. If the length is increased by a certain amount, the area goes up according to the square. Also, when we talk about volume, we have to use a unit of volume. Here I have a little cube. This little cube, you might call a cubic inch, or a cubic meter, or a cubic yard, depending upon the size of the edge. This is the unit for measuring volume. When you want to take a cube with two, two inches or two units on each side, the question becomes, how many of these little cubes can you fit inside? And of course, if you chop it down the middle, you slice it into two pieces, and then you slice each of these pieces, and you find out that you get eight cubes fitting inside this, this little cube here. Here, with a cube of nine, pardon me, with a cube that's three units on each side, I end up with 27 little cubes fitting inside. Now, this is an extremely important point, even today. It says that when you increase the scale of a map by a factor of two, the area of the map is going to increase by a factor of four. If you increase a box by a factor of two, the volume or the capacity of the box is going to increase by a factor of eight. Many people today are interested in solar heating for their homes. Um, you may not realize it, but solar heating becomes much easier if you have a larger number of units being heated with the sun. The reason for this is very simple. You need a storage area. Whenever you heat with the sun, you have to have a place where you can store the heat. If you can double the size of your storage area, you can multiply the amount of heat that you can store by eight because there's eight times as much water inside. On the other hand, the surface area 
the outside, which is the area of this container, only increases by a factor of four. So you have increased the storage capacity by eight, but you've increased the area only by four. What does that mean? Well, the area is important because that's where the heat is lost. So it means that you have less heat lost compared with the amount of heat stored. And it's this ratio, it's called the law of the cube over the square, which makes that scaling factor so important in something like solar energy. It also explains, incidentally, why you couldn't build a ladybug as big as King Kong. Now, that may sound like a crazy idea, but you know, a ladybug, if I had a ladybug on top of the desk and knocked, a, knocked the bug off, the bug would drop to the ground and not get hurt. Whereas, if we were to be pushed off a skyscraper, we would get smashed. Now, why is that? Well, the reason why is because we are so much larger that suppose we're, let's say, a thousand times larger. You have to cube that number to figure out how much heavier we are in weight so that our weight is very, very much larger than would be suggested by just simply the scale factor. On the other hand, the strength of the leg is proportional to how thick it is. And the thickness of the leg only increases by the square. So once again, we have the, the weight that has to be supported increasing fantastically fast, while the strength of the supporting members increase much more slowly. Um, I might also point out in this same diagram that I have in front of me that uh, the Greeks were fascinated with other types of numbers besides the square numbers and the cube numbers. Incidentally, the little two upstairs, of course, uh, indicates two-dimensional number. Four squared, four times four. And here, four cubed, four times four times four. The number of dimensions is indicated by the little number on top, the exponent. The Greeks were also interested in what are called triangular numbers. The triangular numbers are obtained by taking triangles. This is called the third triangular number. You could imagine what the fourth triangular number is. The fourth triangular number would include these black squares as well as the red ones. The Greeks had a name for these numbers. Uh, they symbolized them by the, num by the symbol T with a little n below them. This is the nth triangular number. And the way to find it is by adding up 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n. As you can see, you got one in the corner, two in the next diagonal, three on the next diagonal, four on the next diagonal, and so on. These are called the triangular numbers. Down here, in the little corner of this cube, we have what are called the pyramidal numbers. These are found by building pyramids. One on top, then three on the next layer. Actually, there's one that you can't quite see there because uh, you have to fill out that base. So there's actually four on the next layer. This is the third triangular number there. What I have is the first triangular number plus the second triangular number plus the third triangular number, and so on. Now, the Greeks did not have algebra as we know it. They thought in terms of geometry. But it's amazing how many things you can discover by using what is called geometric algebra. Just take a look at this. Here I have a very standard rule in algebra. It says A multiplied times B plus C is going to equal AB plus AC. In terms of rectangles, this is very simple. It simply says if you take a rectangle which is A units high and B plus C units long, it breaks down into two rectangles, AB plus AC. So this says the big rectangle equals the sum of the two little rectangles. Here's another law from algebra. It says that if you take a square which has two units put together of unequal length, B and C, what is the area of this large square? The area of the large square is obtained by adding up four pieces, this square, this square, and these two rectangles. This gives the, the famous formula b plus c quantity squared is b squared plus twice bc, those are the two rectangles, plus this little corner up here, c squared. Now, when we come to irregular shapes, the question of area is perhaps a little more interesting. Suppose we have a triangle. 
but has base 9 and height 5. What is the area of this triangle? If you try and fit squares inside the triangle, you have difficulty because, of course, some of the squares don't quite fit. And so then you have little fractional squares, and it's very difficult to see what the area is going to be. But the Greeks had an easy way out of that. What they did was they completed the triangle to make a rectangle. And then it's very easy to see that if you look at this half, you have one part of the triangle is half this rectangle. And if you look at the other half, this part of the triangle is one half of that rectangle. So that all together, the area of the triangle is exactly one half the area of the rectangle around it. This gives, of course, the famous formula. The area for a rectangle is the base times the height. For a triangle, it's one half the base times the height. From this, <clears throat> we can move to the area of a circle. If you try and fit triangles inside circles, they won't quite fit. But as the triangle becomes smaller and smaller in its base, the fit becomes better and better and better. We see down here that the area of this circle is almost equal to the sum of the areas of all these triangles. And since the base of these triangles adds up to the circumference of the circle, and since the height of the triangles is the radius of the circle, using the formula for a triangle, one half the base times the height, I end up with this formula for the area of a circle. It's one half the circumference times the radius. And that's where the formula pi r squared comes from. It relates the circumference of a circle to the area of a circle. Having obtained that much, one can move to three-dimensional shapes. The three-dimensional shapes are obtained by slicing into layers. For example, if I take a cylinder, I can slice this cylinder. If it's five units high, I can slice it into five layers. And this way, it's easy to see that the number of cubes that can be fit inside this cylinder is going to be obtained by the area of the base, which is the number of squares you can get, multiplied by the height. This will work for any figure which has a constant cross section. It's going to be the area of the base multiplied by the height. It's a little bit more complicated when we come to solid figures which do not have a constant cross section. I have here a figure of some of, these fig uh, some of these types of objects. For example, this is the famous Egyptian pyramid with a square base and tapering up to a top. The question is, what's the volume of this object? Here I have a triangular pyramid, and here I have a circular pyramid which is also known as a cone. It turns out in all cases, that the volume of these pointy objects is exactly one-third the volume of the original object that surrounds it, that is, the object with constant cross-section. Now, it might be interesting to note that if I could prove this for a square-based pyramid, it would automatically follow for all the other shapes because if I can cover the, the base with little squares, and then pinch the top to a single point. And if every one of them becomes one-third as large, then the whole volume will become one-third as large. So it's enough to prove it for one pyramid. Now let me step over here to the table, and I'll show you a little model that I've made. This is actually a triangular solid. It has a constant cross-section. I don't know if you can see that. You have to focus in very tight. Now, you can see that there's a triangular solid, and uh, it's got a constant cross-section. And I've built this so that it decomposes into three equal shapes, which are pyramids. This simply shows that each one of these pyramids has a volume which is one-third as large as the original solid. A much more impressive problem in calculating volumes 
is the problem of calculating the volume of a sphere. Now this is one of Archimedes' greatest accomplishments. What he did was he took a sphere, imagined it inside a cylinder, and took slices of the sphere. Incidentally, this technique is still used today. It's the basis of what is called the integral calculus, and yet it was developed hundreds of years before Christ. This represents one little slice of the sphere. If you can take all of the slices and stack them up, you will recover the sphere and you'll be able to calculate the volume of the sphere. Now what Archimedes did was he compared the slices with the slices of a cone. And what he discovered was that each little slice for a sphere is equal to what's left over when you remove the slice from the cone. Since the cone is one third the volume of a cylinder, it follows that a sphere is two thirds the volume of a cylinder. And these are the kind of accomplishments that were achieved by simply using imagination and exactness in thinking in ancient days. Now, um, I've only got a couple of minutes left and I want to show you one very famous result, which is the Pythagorean theorem. And this is Pythagoras' theorem stated and proved. It says that if you take a right angle triangle, A, B, and C, and if you look at the square on the hypotenuse, which is this C squared, that should equal the sum of the squares on the other two sides. Now the proof is very simple. This big square here can be broken up as follows. There are four triangles around the outside and C squared in the middle. Over here, on the other side, I have the same situation, but I've got it chopped up differently. I have A squared, B squared, and two rectangles. Now, if you compare these two drawings side by side, you will discover that two of these triangles, these two triangles here, fit together to make one of these black rectangles. And the other two triangles fit together to make the other black rectangle. And what's left over is c squared equals a squared plus b squared. And that is a straightforward, simple proof of Pythagoras' theorem. Now, <coughs> Euclid came about 300 years before Christ, and he developed a complete axiomatic system for geometry, which I will be talking about in the next uh, lecture, which is dealing with non-Euclidean geometry and what happened in the 19th century.